I've got with us today Tony Atwood and Michelle Garnett, and um, thanks very much for coming here today. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thanks, yeah. thanks, Paul. It's great to be here. Thank you. I, I know that we are having this conversation across the oceans and across continents. That you're in Brisbane and Australia at the moment. Obviously, I'm I'm in the UK. Um, but thanks very much for joining us. Really, I know we're in in different times at the moment while we're doing this particular recording. So uh, we are, where are we here at the moment? We're at 20 to 11. Um, and I think you're in the early evening, is that correct, in, in Brisbane at the moment? We, we are, and uh, it's absolutely dark outside. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's a lovely right. okay. autumnal evening over here. It's very nice. Our oh, hot wow, weather right. has just finished, so we're enjoying the cool change. It's lovely. Yes. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for joining us. Um, we're having a chat obviously with you today about your masterclass that's actually running in November on the 16th and 17th of November entitled Succeeding with Autism in Adolescents and Young Adults. And I, I, I sort of wanted to, to ask you a bit about this, but I wanted to start off really um, with um, some sort of interesting, well, I think are interesting underlying assumptions um, about the master, master class and, and to just to to explore them a bit with you. It's pretty unusual to see any training on the idea of success or flourishing with autistic people. Most of the time, as I'm sure you're aware, it, it tends to be purely problem defined and problem focused. Why do you think that looking at success is actually so important? when we're working with autistic folk? Because success is there. It's not what you achieved, it's how far you've traveled to achieve that. It's having one friend, not half a dozen friends and being the life and soul of the party and so on. So we often find that the sense of self in autism is based on negative experiences, the criticisms and rejection of their peer group, not compliments and inclusion. And another characteristic of autism is to be unfortunately very self-critical, far more critical than any parent or teacher. I, I don't meet my expectations, etc. And there's a negativity, which is a major source of depression, as well as just low self-esteem. But there are talents. And part of our work is to define what is the talent. Now, the assumption is that in autism, it's going to be in information technology. They're going to be computer experts or engineers. Yes, but they will also be in the arts. They will have the ability to draw in a way of color, perspective and attention to detail that is absolutely extraordinary. It is the ability to sing in perfect pitch, to create music. And we find for teenagers, if they can't express their inner world in conversation, they will find you a music track they will play music, they will find a photograph or a painting that describes their inner world in an eloquence that is not there in speech. And that's why for some with autism, their career is in the arts because that's how they describe the self and their experiences. It's also a group of people who by nature, Michelle and I would agree, yeah. some of the kindest... I was about to talk about, <laughs> yeah, okay. can I well, say, yeah, yes. caring professions. You, yeah. you, if you, it's mm. something when I first came into autism that I did not expect at all, that, you know, that the special interest, if you like, or the, uh, the silver lining in the cloud, as we might call it, would <clears> be the compassionate heart yeah. of the person with autism. And that's one of my great and delightful discoveries in this, that if you're working with autistic people, you're usually working with a really lovely, kind, compassionate group of people. And I think that's often missed. And so we don't necessarily think of autistic people in the caring professions, for example, being counsellors, psychologists, speech pathologists, psychiatrists, etc. But they make mm -hmm. amazing caring um, individuals, professionals. And so, you know, and I know not everybody on the spectrum or go to university and become a clinical psychologist, but the caring for animals, going to the RSPCA, working in the zoos, caring for the elderly, being involved in programs in hospitals to assist. There are so many ways to practice serving others, altruism. 
And we find that this is an amazing career opportunity. But I did want to come back mm. to, just in terms of success, that your first question was, you know, what's this about success? Aren't we in a deficit model here with autism? <laughs> and you'd think so when you read the international definition. Yeah, it is. Oh, very that's much. tragedy. You might as well go and kill yourself. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be there it's forever. Tragedy. You'll never do this. You'll never have a relationship. You'll never business. have a job. You'll yes. always be on government. Uh, money and you might as well keep yourself. Unemployment rates, through yeah. the roof, etc. We found the opposite mm. actually. There's a there's so much to be excited about and to enjoy and to celebrate in autism. And that's our genuine attitude. So we found that as we meet people and discover their profile in terms of their values, their personality, their abilities, and their interests. It's rich, it's broad, and we need autistic people in our community. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want our parents, carers, professionals, teachers, mm -hmm. everyone we're working with to see. So, for example, when we do diagnostic assessment, we call it a discovery. If we've discovered autism, we're delighted. It's congratulations, you have autism. Mm -hmm. You're a member of the club. Yeah. That, that's why you are fabulous at mathematics, why you are great in playing the violin, why you are phenomenal in caring for your friend. Yes, it's why you are phenomenally honest, why you have such hyper focus, yep. why you can point out what's going wrong in any array or, um, you know, spot the error. The uh, perfectionism that can come along, the attitude toward doing things extremely yeah. well, the tenacity, the per persistence that can be there. And as we say these things, of, co of course, not everyone with autism will have all of those qualities, but they will have an enormous number of strengths and qualities. So what we have found is that when we bring this attitude, with this understanding that we've gained mm -hmm. with our years in autism, Parents get excited, teachers get excited. There's actually energy in this. I've met far too many families who have come from the doom and gloom model. And when they hear what we're saying, they thought, I thought autism was a disaster. I've been told my child will never be like other children, that they won't find their place in the community. And, we've, and, and we completely mm. passionately disagree with that. And, and more than that, we find that that's actually a very depressing, energy reducing outlook, which tends to be self-fulfilling. So there's a lot of reasons behind our approach for success. Yeah, I, I endorse a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you treat it as a disaster, it will become a disaster. And the teenager will reject the diagnosis mm -hmm. and reject any ideas. But if you bring in the positives, then they are going to also bring in the encouragement and the strategies. Mm. Wow. There's, <laughs> so let, me just try, let me just try and, and, and get my head around that and to recap it, because it feels to me like this is really important. So first of all, it's this, this approach has implications potentially overall for the self-esteem and self-confidence in the autistic person. It, it provides I guess, a structure in which the autistic person can discover particular strengths or particular talents that they actually have. And it, it can provide potentially a route in terms of where they're going to go to um, or where they already are on the way to in, in their lives. I, I, just, I just really wanted to, to ask another thing here, which was, um, it, you know, this whole idea you, you mentioned about um, parents um, often starting off from the assumption that you know autism is always a disaster etc mm -hmm. I just wonder whether you think that certainly for a lot of staff that are actually working maybe not specializing in the field but but periodically working with, with autistic people whether you think that they could potentially benefit as well from having more of a success flourishing um, knowledge and attitude towards um, autism. Absolutely, <laughs> totally. Yeah, I, yeah I mean, you, you just, you just said, said it. it. We agree. it. Absolutely, absolutely. Because it, you know, I think that the problem is that autism is in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. Like, it's just in the wrong place, I think. If you just see it as a disorder, uh, and a focus on a deficit model, then you're always trying to fix something as if it was a, 
I don't know, an illness or a cold or something, and as if it's something you suffer. And we just find that that attitude doesn't really help uh, yeah. very much, especially not a teenager who doesn't want to be put in that box. Actually, anyone wouldn't want to be put in that box. We're not trying to eliminate or minimise at all the suffering that can happen when you're autistic because unfortunately most people are not autistic so it's very difficult to be in a minority group in our community because there's not a lot of understanding yet about neurological difference. I think if we had a, a different manual that was about neurodivergence and that you know there's all these different ways of being human and even though we all might look the same in terms of, you know, you can't see that difference on the face, all the faces, you know, you can't read the mind. But if you can see that uh, because of your experience and your eyes are open to different ways of being in the world, there's more acceptance and enjoyment of that, then I think people with autism will have a better life. So in our community. So I think the difficulties for people with autism are more about ignorance and myths and misconceptions and being categorized into something small, uh, I think those are some of the biggest challenges that our autistic members of the community face. Yeah, and it's going to lead to psychopathology. And I'm it afraid. does, anxiety about being different, effective, yep. not being able to make friends, not being understood by peers at school, people thinking I'm weird, and then having bullying and rejection and teasing, which we know, unfortunately, for our guys on the autism spectrum goes from kindergarten right through the workforce. So we have lots of uh, people out there with autism who are suffering from misunderstanding. They're being abused, bullied, yeah. traumatized. And on, on that topic, one of the things that we're, we're very keen on encouraging is not only an acceptance of, of self as who you are, but also the biggest challenge in autism can often be neurotypicals especially for teenagers yes. neurotypicals are toxic they are detrimental to the autistic person's mental state <laughs> and so we often have to teach them how to cope with bullying and teasing rejection and humiliation mm. and what we're saying is don't change who you are mm. be true to yourself but explain yourself i'm the sort of person who tends to look away when you're talking it helps me concentrate on what you're saying I'm the sort of person who really loves talking about drain colours, but I'm not good at reading signs of boredom. <laughs> if I'm boring you, please tell me and I'll stop. I'm the sort of person who. So what we if you use the old fashioned term Asperger's syndrome, we're saying um, be a first rate Aspie, not a second rate neurotypical be true to who you are, which comes into the camouflaging, which is a whole new area that is delaying diagnosis, causing depression, all sorts of things that are occurring. So it's often for the teenager, where the wheels are falling off, I can't camouflage anymore, that you have all sorts of issues occurring. Be true to yourself. Okay, well, that sort of leads in really to to sort of the next issue that I, I sort of really wanted to raise with you. Th this particular masterclass that you're running in November, um, it, it, one of the things I think that's unusual about it to some degree is that um, there's often a lot of interest in autistic children, but less so in uh, sorry less so in adolescents and particularly in young adults, which is obviously the focus of um, this particular event. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that there is less interest very often in adolescents and, long, and young adults with autism? I think there's a myriad of reasons, really. I mean, one, one is, I think that, you know, just on a, on a basic level, um, autism is first usually diagnosed, not always, usually diagnosed in childhood. And it's in the DSM, again, it's in the DSM as a, a disorder that usually emerges in childhood, like a childhood disorder. A lot of people see autism then as a childhood disorder. Uh, it's uh, the media is getting better at this, but there's been a lot more focus on early intervention. And we look at children. Funding goes often to children because the children, uh, it's a prevention of problems later on. And so there can be a lot of focus in training programs on early intervention with autism. And I think some of our uh, misconceptions about autism is that 
it, it, it must kind of vanish in adulthood or it goes away <laughs> because you're right. You don't see the same interests that you don't see the, the books and the awareness of needs of autistic adults in the workplace, for example, or how do we train our high school teachers to teach autistic teenagers? But it doesn't go away. I mean, we have all of these uh, people referred in to, for reassessment and we have to reassess them to get funding at high school. Do they still have autism is the underlying question. And we're like, we feel like writing on the report. Has the autism the, gone? <laughs> yes. Save the family a lot of time and money, not doing another diagnostic assessment. Just say, look, autism is a lifelong condition. So uh, it's, a, it's a lifelong neurological difference. And I think we need a lot more education around this to kind of wake people up that, that it doesn't go away. There's always going to be particular challenges for a person on the autism spectrum. And there's loads of ways, many, many ways that we can support, understand and uh, scaffold that person to, to manage those challenges through those teenage years and adult years. So we've for years been doing workshops on how do you assist uh, adults who have autism, autistic adults. Uh, initially, the very first one we did, which was probably a, ooh, about 16 years ago in the Gold Coast, uh, near Brisbane in Queensland, and I remember we had about 25 people there, because people weren't recognising in their clinics, uh, in the various places that adults go when they have struggles, they weren't recognising they were actually seeing adults who had autism. These adults were being treated for all the other sorts of conditions. Yeah, and that, that comes to a, a point here mm -hmm. that it, it's often in the teenage years that other conditions are diagnosed, eating disorders, gender dysphoria, mm -hmm. um, borderline personality disorder, etc. And so sometimes what people will do is focus on those conditions which are perhaps more easy to diagnose, but then in the eating disorder clinic realize, oh, there's something else here, the gender dysphoria. Um, so we're recognizing that often there are multiple issues and people will see the psychiatric disorder, not the autism. Which, yeah, which that's is problematic, a, yeah. Sorry, I was gonna say, that's an interesting point. I mean, about why that would be the case. I mean, is it just basically a training issue that, that in, in a sense that, folks working with mental health problems have got training in mental health problems, but they won't necessarily yes, have- It is a training and, and that's why we're doing the masterclass, mm. is basically, if you are involved with any kids, teenagers, you will come across those with autism. Mm. You need to be able to recognize it and modify your treatment mm. according to exactly. cognitive profile and experiences, whatever branch of therapy, psychology that you're involved with, also education. education. You will come across autistic kids and you need to know. Yes, it is different. Mm. If you, That's what I was alluding to before, that if the autism side isn't recognized, then it's potentially going to be the case that the traditional methods of psychotherapy, emotion management, ways we have of teaching uh, teenagers and young people are not going to work. Ways we manage our autistic employees and, you know, it's not going to work using the neurotypical methods. So we found mm. if you understand autism and you have a, a working knowledge of how to modify some traditional ideas within education, psychotherapy, organisational psych management, then you'll go a lot further with autism. You'll really bring those people in. They will flourish, they will thrive, and we will have a better community mm. for that. An interesting component is the research suggests that those who have the worst outcome for eating disorders, borderline personality, etc., are those who have signs mm -hmm. of autism, which basically tells you current therapy models don't work right. as well. Yeah, we've got right. Well, that that sort of that's that's interesting because it, it again leads into my next question, really, which is that we know that very commonly problems in adolescence and in early adulthood coincide with transitional issues with, with change issues which are developmental you know such as you know first romantic relationships leaving school getting a job etc are these identical for autistic folks for autistic adolescents and young adults particularly 
or are there additional factors that, that you think need addressing? I think you would have the, the conventional problems, romantic relationships and so on, but they're going to be much greater. And when we actually try and teach an autistic person to read body language, the most confusing body language is flirting. Mm. And how do you understand that? Mm. And how do you know when someone likes you if, and you like them and do you like them the same amount and, and crushes? Or we get the opposite quite on, all my friends are talking about boyfriends, girlfriends and having sex. Ew, yuck, I hate it. And this is the person who's 17. Mm. And as far as they're concerned, I'm not interested in that sort of thing, or I've got to do this to become popular. So it's a major change that's occurring. But one of the big problems is connectedness. In the teenagers, they're trying to connect with a group of people. They're often rejected by the uh, conventional uh, popular guys. So they will go to someone who does accept a broader range of normality. They are desperate for connectedness. They're often set up. All sorts of horrible things will occur. Yeah. Somebody I had an email from today, he was at high school and a group of other boys, they got a, uh, a water uh, device and they went up to him, squirted it over his trousers where his penis would be and filmed it and put it on uh, social media that he'd wet himself. Oh God. Oh. And I think... <laughs> It's so, sh ah! it's really shaming him publicly. It is. Isn't it? And my concern is not that, that guy, it's what neurotypicals will do to someone who's different. One of yeah. the major reasons that somebody's bullying the teeth is that they are different, and yet they are amazing in how they cope with that. So, bullying and teasing in the teenage years goes into extra dimensions. You've got all sorts of intense emotions occurring and fewer coping mechanisms that are going to occur. In that, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I just on that topic, I was mm. thinking one of the additional factors that you're asking about, Paul, in that question about transitions is that we found that our guys on the autism spectrum tend to feel their own emotions incredibly intensely. So they have very strong emotions, whether that's jealousy, guilt, shame, anxiety, anger, etc but less uh, management strategies. Mm -hmm. So when you get a transition, we know there's lots of emotions that go on with transitions, you know, the sense of loss for what you had before, the longing for that, jealousy perhaps of other people that are still experiencing that. Especially that you if you've got a younger brother or sister yeah. who has so many friends yeah. and they're so popular. What are they doing? What are they doing? Yeah. And then you've got the anxiety of the new and the uncertain, which is huge in autism. So the anxiety is at its zenith. And you've got this other difficulty in autism, an additional factor, which is they don't generalize their learning very well. So all the learning that was perhaps, you know, for example, in the transition from primary school to high school, the, as we call it over here, you know, secondary school um, over there, perhaps, so they, they learn how to make friends and get on with the teachers and how to sit still in class and all of these things. And then you get to high school, but it all seems different because the environment's different, the teachers are different, the people are different. And it's as if everything that was learned in the previous environment is no longer available. Yeah. So they're lost, there's no strategy. So you can see actually transitions are one of the biggest challenges for our guys yeah. on the spectrum. There's a lovely phrase, in primary school, it's cool to be kind. Mm. At secondary school, it's called to be cruel. Mm. And these are the ones that are the victims of cruelty. So a lot of our work with the young adults is trying to undo the damage done by their right. peer group. Yes. But one of the best insulators is a friend. Yes. And they need the social curriculum. Mm. They need to know who would be a good friend for you, how often to contact them, what to talk about, etc. So the social curriculum is crucial in the high school years. It is yeah. absolutely crucial. And as you know, in the in the high school years and then beyond into young adult years, these are the most complex social situations the person has ever had to face. And they can seem incredibly overwhelming because if you have been born with innately the neural networks to allow you to do social without thinking too much about it, it's on automatic pilot. It's like, what's the problem? But if that's missing, how do you negotiate the high school, how, the jungle of the playground, the 
the predators, the uh, potential friends, all of the people you need to relate to. It becomes very complex, very overwhelming, very quickly. And so what we find often with our young people is that we're, we're really trying to put in place many avenues for them to have mentors and guides who are not going to think, well, that's a stupid question, you should know that. Mm -hmm. It's actually able to be listening to the concerns and then pointing out why are my peers so puzzling? Why do they talk about all those boring topics? What, what, are, you, what are you supposed to do when you um, meet someone? How do you have a conversation? How do you what, talk with the group? Why do they roll their eyes when I, yeah. I say those sorts of things? We, we talk about a game called Puzzling Peers. Mm. And it's very popular amongst the teenagers uh, in our group because we do, we are oh, the groups. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. can, yes. Can, we, can we just digress for a moment? We really enjoy doing groups okay. with autistic teenagers. Yes. They relax, they make friends, they take the advice of those who have been through it. And yes. it's, it, it, we do find group work with teenagers less successful with primary school, but in the teenage years, uh, oh, they do. They do. And you think you, it's such a, a sort of oxymoron. Also, it's like groups, autism, what are you thinking? They do one on one. But we found that if the majority of the people in the room are autistic, it's an autistic culture that reigns and there's like-mindedness, there's real connection. And we found that for mm. the first time, many of our teenagers feel accepted for who they are. They're able to give and receive compliments with peers yeah. for the first time. Yes, and, and safe. Yeah. It's safe and they feel connection. And so yes. the group is wonderful, obviously, for teaching things like emotion regulation strategies, but far greater, I think, is the connections made and the friendships that exist way into the adult life yeah. beyond the groups. So, yeah, as Tony said, we get very excited about groups. We love well, groups. I'm sorry, yes, we, we do. But it's a sense of connection. And then what happens is Michelle and I just sit back and they support each other. Well, I'm feeling depressed, only kill myself. And one of the guys said, what? And then one said, what? And, and we suddenly see a degree of cohesion and mutual support that if it was a group of, there were the one or two in a group of neurotypicals, I'm sorry, it would not work. No, that's really yeah. Can I just say that, that <laughs> um, I, I wanted to sort of tie this conversation up with one last question, which I, I, I sort of feel to some extent it's slightly redundant given the enormous amount of advice and understanding that you've given over this just very short period of time. But I'm gonna try and ask you to concentrate it down even further. You two folks have decades of experience between you in working clinically and engaging in, in research work with autistic folk. And I just wondered whether you could identify one piece of advice that you would say that professionals and parents should remember more than any other. I know there's a lot, but more than <laughs> any other. <laughs> I can give it a go. You know, it's, it, it's interesting, isn't it, when you ask questions like that, because you're right. I mean, we calculate it now. Between us, we've got over 80 years of clinical experience, which just sound, it makes us sound so elderly. We're almost embarrassed to say it. And one piece of advice, I know when you've got this much, how do you whittle it down? But I do have an answer mm. for that because, uh, and I'm cheating really, because mine is too. But the reason I called the clinic I created um, 16 years ago now in Brisbane, Minds and Hearts, is because I truly believe that the two best interventions in autism are knowledge knowledge about the condition about autism and what it really is in terms of all the strengths the qualities the values that we've talked about as well as the challenges for that person so knowledge about autism and that person's profile and that's kind of like the roadmap of how we help them and we understand the person and that's the mind and then the other part is the heart and i think that's as important if not more important so if we bring heart if we bring acceptance compassion yeah. love love, respect, mm. and, and a sense of celebration about who this person is, how they are, that's the attitude, you know, that's what, that's going to cause the conditions for growth out of adversity. And then we get the blooms, then we get the beauty of that person's um, true authentic self and self-acceptance and acceptance around them. So for me, it's definitely minds and hearts, it's knowledge and attitude, which really is heart. 
Okay. But my view is exactly the same. Yes. Well, we've worked together a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we copied each other. We, we copied that we, we have the same approach. We do. No, seriously, it, it, is, it is having, uh, from my perspective, I've learned more from those with autism than from any textbook or research article. So it's, it's get to know the person because they will allow you into their world when they trust you and you'll discover what works with them. But a lot of the strategies have to be a discovery rather than imposed. Yeah. Wow. Well, I think on that very important note, I'd like to bring things to a close. Um, again, thank you very much for joining us um, in Australia. And we are looking forward enormously to the masterclass that you'll be running on succeeding with autism with um, adolescents and young adults that's occurring in November. You take care. We're very enthusiastic about <laughs> yeah, it because we, we have lots of things. We're almost, dare I say, almost evangelical. No, I don't know whether evangelical is the right word. We are very passionate. passionate. Yeah. I think I passionate. Think I think that, that is your second name, if not your first name. It's you passionate. Are driven by passion, Tony. It's who you are. And I caught it from Tony. It's actually the bug of autism. I think once you get infected, you can't take it off. It's just a fascinating area. And we hope to come over there via the screen and infect you with the bug of autism and the passion that we have for it and the love we have for it. Yeah, and your life will never be the same again. No. <laughs> thank you so much, folks. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you. Paul, thank much you. Now.